there is a valley. In South England, remote from ambition and from fear. But the passage of strangers is rare and unperceived. from where the scent of grass in summer is breathed only by those who are native to that unvisited land. The roads to the channel, that's the English channel, do not traverse it, but choose upon either side easier passes over the range. And one track alone leads up through it to the hills. And this is changeable. Now a green where men have few occasion to go, and now a good road where it nears the homesteads and the barns. And the woods grow steep above the slopes, and sometimes reach the very summit of the heights, or where they cannot attain to fill in and clothe the coombs. along the floor of the valley, deep pastures and their silence are bordered by lawns of chalky grass and the small yew trees of the downs. And the clouds that visit its sky reveal themselves beyond the one great rise and sail white and enormous to the other, and sink beyond that other. But the plains above which they have travelled, and the weald to which they go, the people of the valley cannot see, and hardly recall. it reaches such fields is no longer a gale from the salt, but is fruitful and soft, an inland breeze. And those whose blood was nourished here feel in that wind the fruitfulness of our orchards and all the life that all things draw from the air. In this place, when I was a boy, I pushed through a fringe of beaches that made a complete screen between me and the world. And I came to a glade called No Man's Land. I climbed beyond and I was surprised and glad, because from the ridge above that glade I saw the sea. And to this place, very lately I returned. And the many things that I recovered as I came up through the countryside were not less charming than when a distant memory had enshrined them, but much more. And whatever veil is thrown by a longing recollection did not intensify or even make more mysterious the beauty of that happy ground. Not even in my very dreams of mourning had I, in exile, seen it more beloved or more rare and much that I had forgotten now returned to me as I approached. A group of elms, the little turn of the parson's wall, a small paddock beyond the graveyard close, cherished by one man and guarded by a low wall of very old stone all around. And all these things fulfilled and amplified my delight until the good vision of the place which I had kept for so many years left me and was replaced by its better reality. And here I said to myself, is a symbol of what some would say is reserved for the soul, a pleasure of a kind that cannot be imagined, save in a moment when at last it is attained. 
And when I came to my own gate, and my own field, and had before me the house that I knew, I looked around a little, although it was already late evening. And I saw the grass standing as it should stand when it is ready for the scythe. For in this, as in everything that a man can do, there is an exact moment when they are done best. And it has been remarked that whatever rules us does so blunderingly, seeing that the good things that are given to man are not given at the precise moment when it would have filled him with delight. But whether this is true or false, we can choose the just turn of the season in everything we do, and especially in the making of hay. And many think that grass is best cut when it is thickest, and so they delay it until it is rank and in flower, and already heavily pulled the ground. And another false reason for delay is wet weather. For few understand that we always have rain in South England between the sickle and the scythe, or say just after the weeks of east wind are over. First we have a week of sudden warmth, as though the south has come to see us all. And then we have the weeks of east and southeast wind, and then we have more or less of that rain of which I spoke. Now it is just before, or during, or at the very end of that rain, that grass should be cut for hay. And true, upland grass, which is always thin, should be cut later than the grass that is in the bottoms and along the water meadows, but never, not even in the latest or westest seasons, should it be allowed to flower or even to seed. For what we get when we store our grass is not a harvest of something ripe, but a thing just caught in its prime before maturity, as witness our corn and our straw are best yellow, but our hay is best green. And so also, death should be represented by a scythe, and time with a sickle, for time can only take that which is ripe. But death always comes too soon. And in a word, then, it is always easier to cut grass too late than too early. And I, under that evening, and come back to these pleasant fields, looked at the grass, and knew that it was time. And June was in full advance. It was the beginning of that season when the night has already lost her foothold on the earth and hovers over it, never quite descending, but mixing the sunset with the dawn. The next morning, before it was yet broad day, I awoke and thought of the mowing. And the birds were already chattering in the trees beside my window, all except the nightingale who had left, and flown away to the weald where he sings all summer, by day as well as by night, in the oaks and in the hazel spinneys, and especially along the little river Ada, one of the little rivers of the weald. All the birds and the thought of mowing had awakened me, and I went down the stairs and along the stone floors to where I could find the scythe. When I took it from its nail, I remembered how, fourteen years ago, when I last went out with my scythe to sow into the fields at dawn, that in between that day and this were many things cities and armies, the confusion of books, mountains and the desert, and horrible great breadths of sea. I went out into the tall grass before the sun was yet risen, but there were already many colours in the eastern sky, and I made haste to sharpen my scythe so as to get to the cutting before the dew should rise. Now many think that it is better to wait till the dew has risen so as to get the grass quite dry from the very first. But although there is advantage in getting the grass quite dry from the first, yet it is not worthwhile to wait till the dew has risen, since in the first place you lose many hours of labour and those the coolest. But next, more importantly, you lose that great ease and thickness of cutting that comes of the dew. So I at once began to sharpen my scythe. And there's an art also in the sharpening of a scythe, and it is worth describing carefully. First, 
your blade must be quite dry, which is why you will see men wiping with grass before they're wetted. And so also your stone must be quite dry, and on this account it is a good thing to lay it on your coat and keep it there for all your days mowing. The scythe, you stand upright with the blade pointing away from you, and putting your left hand firmly on the back of the blade, grasping it, you pass the stone first down one side of the blade edge and then the other, beginning at the handle and going on to the point and working quickly and hard. And when you do this at first, you may perhaps cut your hand, but only at first will such an accident happen to you. And to tell when your blade is sharp enough, this is the rule. First the stone clangs and grinds against the iron harshly. And then it rings musically to one note. And then it purrs as though the iron and the stone were exactly suited. And when you hear this, you know that your blade is sharp enough. And when I heard it that June dawn, with everything quite silent except the birds, I let down my scythe and bent myself to mow. And when one does anything anew after so many years, one fears very much one's trick or habit. But all things, once learned, are easily recoverable, and I very soon recovered the swing and the power of the mower. Now mowing well, or mowing badly, or even not mowing at all, are separated by very little, as was also true of writing verse, or of playing the fiddle, or of a dozen other things, but of nothing more than of believing. For the bad, or the young, or untaught mower, without tradition, for the mower, Promethean, for the mower, original, and with contempt for the past, he does all these things. He leaves great crescents of grass uncut. He digs the point of the blade hard into the ground with a jerk. He loosens the handles, even the fastening of the blade. He twists the blade and he blunts the blade, he chips it and dulls it, or even breaks it clean off at the tip. And if anyone is standing by, he cuts him in the ankle. And he swings up wildly into the air with nothing to resist his stroke. And he drags up earth with the grass, which is like making the meadow bleed. But the good mower, who does things as they should be done, and have been done for a hundred thousand years, falls into none of these fooleries. over the field very steadily, the blade of his scythe just barely missing the ground, every grass falling and the swing and the rhythm of his mowing are always the same. For so great an art cannot be learnt without continual practice. But this much is worth writing down that as in all good work, to know the thing with which you work is the core of the affair. Good verse is written on good paper with an easy pen, not a lump of coal on a whitewashed wall. The pen thinks for you, and so does the scythe mow for you if you treat it honourably and in a manner which makes it recognise its service. And the manner is this. You must regard the scythe as a pendulum that swings and not as a knife that cuts. mower puts no more strength into his stroke than into his lifting. And then again stand tall into your work. The bad mower, eager and full of pain, leans forward and tries to force the blade through the grass. But the good mower, serene and able, stands nearly as tall as the shape of the scythe will let him and follows up every stroke closely moving his left foot forward. And then again, 
get your stroke well away. Mowing is a thing of ample gestures, like drawing a cartoon. And then also be in a mechanical and repetitive mood and be thinking of anything at all but your mowing and be anxious only when there seems some interruption to the monotony of the sound. And in this, your mowing should be like one's prayers, all of a sort and always the same, and so made that you can establish a monotony that works them, as it were, with only half your mind. The happier half, the half that does not bother. Well, in this way, when I had recovered the art after so many years, I moved forward over the field, cutting lane after lane through the grass, and bringing out its most secret essences with the sweep of the scythe until the air was full of odours. And at the end of each lane, I sharpened my scythe, looked back at the work done, and then carried the scythe back down again upon my shoulder to begin another. So that long before the bell rang, in the chapel above me, that's long before six o'clock, which was the time of the Angelus, I had already many sways lying in order parallel, like soldiery. And the high grass yet standing, making a great contrast with the shaven part, looked dense and high. As it says in the ballad of Val Adunes, the tall son of the seven winds came riding out of hither hithahithe, and his sword was like a scythe and arcus when the grass is high. And all the swathes in order lie, and there's the bailiff standing by, a gathering of the tithe. And so I mowed all that morning, until the houses awoke in the valley, and from some of them rose a little fragrant smoke, and men began to be seen. I stood still and rested upon my scythe to watch the awakening of the village when I saw, coming up to my field, a man whom I had known in older times before I left the valley. And it was the dark, silent race upon which all the learned quarrel, but by which whatever meaningless name you may give it, Celtic, Iberian, or what you will, is the permanent root of all England and makes it wealthy and preserves it everywhere except perhaps in the Fens and in a part of Yorkshire. But everywhere else you'll find it active and strong. And these people are intensive and their thoughts and their labours turn inwards. And it is on account of their presence in these isles that our gardens are the richest in the world. And they also love low rooms, ample fires, and great warm slopes of thatch. And they have, as I believe, an older acquaintance with the English air than of any other of all the strains that make up England. They hunted in the wheel with stones. They camped in the pines on the green sand. And they lurked under the oaks of the upper rivers and watch the legionaries, as the Roman legionaries, march up, up the straight paved road from the sea. And they helped a few pirates destroy the towns. And they mixed with those pirates and shared the spoils of the Roman villas and were glad to see the captains and the priests destroyed. And they remain. And no admixture of the Frisian pirate or of the Angevin or of the Breton or of the Norman conquerors has very much affected their cunning eyes. And to this race, I say, belonged the man who now approached me. And he said, mowing? And I said, ah. And then he said, ah, as though in duty bound, for so we speak to each other in the steens and the downs. And then he said, as he had nothing to do, he'd lend me a hand, and I thanked him warmly or kindly, as we say, for it is a good custom of ours to treat bargaining as though it were a courteous pastime. For although what he was after was money, and what I wanted was his labour at the least pay, we each both played out the comedy we were free men, one granting a grace and the other accepting it. For the dry bones of commerce, avarice, method and need are odious to the people of the valley. And so we covered them up with a pretty body of fiction and observances. And thus, when it comes to buying pigs, the buyer will not begin by decrying the pig and the vendor praising it, as is the custom with lesser men. But 
tradition makes them do business in this fashion. First, the buyer will go up to the seller when he's in his own steading, and looking admiringly at the pig, will say that it may or may not rain, or that it will have snow or hail or whatever according to the time of year. And the seller, looking critically at his pig, will agree the weather is as his friend maintains. And then the buyer will say, that's a fine looking pig there, mister, giving the seller's name. Ah, a fine looking pig, says the seller. And there's no haste at all, and a great leisure marks the dignity of their exchange. And then as they're reluctantly admitting the strength and beauty of the pig, the seller falls into a deep thought. And then the buyer, as though moved by a great desire, will say that he's ready to give so much for the pig, and offers about half its proper value or less. Then after some moments of silence, the seller, slowly shaking his head, will say, Well, I wasn't seen in a cell in the pig anyways. But then he'll add that only just last week a party had offered him so much for the pig and names about double its proper value or more. And thus all ritual is duly accomplished and the solemn act is entered upon with reverence and then a spirit of truth. But when the buyer uses this phrase, I tell you what I will do, and offers within half a crown the value of the pig, the seller says he can refuse him nothing and offers half a crown above it. While the difference is split, the pig is sold, and within the quiet soul of each runs the peace of something accomplished. And thus do we buy pigs, or land, or labour, or malt, or lime, always with elaboration and set form. And many a London man has paid double or more for his violence, greedy haste, very unchivalrous higgling. As happened with the land at Underwaltham, which the mortgagees had begged and implored the estate to take for 1,200 and had privately offered all the world for a thousand, but which a sharp, direct man, of the kind that makes a fortune, a man in a motor car, a man in a fur coat, a man of few words, bought before my very eyes, protesting they may take his offer or leave it, for 3,500, and all because he, he had not begun be, with praising the land. Well then, this man, who offered to help me, he went off to get his scythe, but I went into the house and brought out a gallon jar of small ale for him and for me, for the sun was now already very warm and a little Small ale goes very well with mowing. And when we had drunk some of this ale in mugs called I See You, you know, written at the bottom of the mug, we each both took a swathe, he a little behind me as he was the better mower, and for so many hours we swung one before the other, mowing and mowing in the tall grass. And the sun rose to noon when we were still at our mowing food, but only for a little while, until we gained to the mowing. Until at last, there was nothing left but a small square of grass, standing like a square of linesmen, keeping their formation tall and unbroken, with all the dead lying around them after a battle is over and done. And then for some little time I rested after all those hours, and the man and I talked together. off, we heard, in another field, the musical sharpening of a scythe. And the sunlight slanted powdered and mellow across the breadth of the valley, for the day was nearing its end. I went to fetch rakes from the steading, and when I had come back, the last of the grass had fallen field lay flat and smooth with the very green short grass in lanes between the dead and the yellow swathes. And these swathes we raked into haycocks so as to keep them from the dew against our return at daybreak. We made the haycocks as tall and as steep as we could, for in that shape they best keep out the dew, and it is also easier to spread them after the sun has risen. And then we raked up every straggling blade so the whole field was a clean floor for the teddying and the carrying of hay next morning. And 
grass we had mown was but a little over two acres, for that is all the pasture on my little tiny farm. And when we had done all this, there fell upon us the beneficent and deliberate evening. And as we sat for some little time near the rakes, we saw the valley more solemn and dim all around us, and all the trees and hedgerows quite still and held in a complete silence. I paid my companion his, his wage and bid him a good night till we should meet in the same place before sunrise next morning. And he went off with a slow, steady progress, as all our countrymen do, making their walking a part of, of the easy but continual labour of their lives. But I sat on, watching the light creep around towards the north and change, and the waning moon coming up as if by stealth behind the woods of no man's land.